my name is Darcy Madison and I am a hermit crab hobbyist. I think people would definitely consider me a crazy crab lady, yes, for sure. Uh, this is my crab room and I basically have 700 gallons worth of tanks. I have four toppers, uh, seven actual tanks that line the perimeter of one of the bedrooms in my house. And I have 45 hermit crabs, six different species. And basically, this is their house. This is their home. This is where they live. My hermit crab journey began with one of my daughters. We were on a family vacation um, at Port A, and she saw hermit crabs in the souvenir shop, had her own money, and wanted wanted a couple. So I said, all right, well, let's kind of see what's involved in taking care of them. It's an animal after all. So we spoke with the shop owner and um, the, uh, the directions were very simple. Uh, they were not complicated. They were inexpensive. What they needed was pretty much provided right there at the store and they were not a long-term commitment. And so at the time I thought, this will be great. It's your own money. You're, you know, young. This will teach you some responsibility. So sure, yeah, let's get some hermit crabs. Uh, then we took them back to the beach house, and everybody there was kind of playing with them, and we all fell in love with hermit crabs. And so I decided, as a teacher, like I need to have some hermit crabs in my classroom. So the following day, we went back to that same store, and I purchased some of my own hermit crabs um, to bring to my classroom, and that began my hermit crab journey. Early on when we were really struggling with what, you know, information, which recommendations to follow and, you know, um, we were often redoing and buying new things and, I mean, it was just really, um, it was frustrating, honestly, in the beginning, um, until we found um, the Crab Street Journal and all of their wonderful information and files upon files of care guides and you know what we truly fell in love with was that there was all research based um, from hermit crab keepers that had hermit crabs for decades from scientists and things uh, and people like that so to us it was a no-brainer like this was the recommendations that we wanted to follow and then we found Lyco's face Facebook group and land hermit crab owner society um, was just like honestly like they became they are some of you know my really good friends now because we all share this common interest we're all maybe a little bit crazy <laughs> about our crabs um, but it's a place that we can go and find a sense of community a sense of belonging um, the support that you need and that we can just share our journey with um, with each other no matter where we are from somebody coming in on day one and needing you know a lot of help and, and looking for that recommendation to somebody who's kept crabs for 20 30 years stacy griffith is 100 percent the backbone to a crab street journal and the lycos community um, without her driving this passion and desire for change education and advocacy um, i don't think any of us would 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 be able to do what we're doing i mean i just think she is such a great leader and so inspiring and encouraging that she has a whole troop of thousands of us just ready to take her lead and um, advocate for hermit crabs. I am Stacy from the Land Hermit Crab Owner Society. I'm the president of the nonprofit organization. I'm not one of the original founders, but I did take over in approximately 2006 managing the organization. And I'm also the owner of the Crab Street Journal. So back in 1999, when Vanessa and the other founders of Lycos started their hermit crab group on Yahoo, there was just no information out there except the very basic care sheet that FMR gave out. So they just started collaborating and sharing what they knew and started observing their crabs and, you know, sharing notes. Well, this is what, this is what I found and this is what I saw today. And starting to research what even back then they were researching whatever was available you know some of our files that go back like our our nutrition files 
go back to those original days when the original members were doing what research they could in the early days of the internet to better educate themselves about their pets and then sharing that with other people. That that Yahoo group became the Land Hermit Crab Owners Society as an organization. Then Vanessa wanted to have like an online magazine that was the magazine of the society. And that would be where they would house all of the information they had collected on what worked for them caring for their hermit crabs. And that became the Crab Street Journal. So the Crab Street Journal has always been the online magazine or the flagship site of the organization and provided everything that we know and believe to be true about proper hermit crab care free to anybody who comes and wants to read it. The more we spent researching, the more we spent watching other people that kept hermit crabs for decades, the more we realized that um, if we found the proper care, um, they would thrive and they would become really a much more interesting pet to have. They're so largely overlooked I used to do a lot of advocating for dogs and cats, but a lot of people speak up for dogs and cats. And who out there is speaking up for hermit crabs? So somebody needs to speak up for them, and I guess that somebody has, has come to be me. I think that hermit crabs need to be advocated for because it is very distressing to me that millions of animals die every year for no reason. Millions of hermit crabs die every year just solely because we have not educated the public. The hermit crab industry currently, um, you know, simplified, I guess, as best I can, is that you have hermit crabs living their best life out, out on the beach um, and along comes human to collect these hermit crabs. Um, they put them in their bag and store them in you know the backs of their trucks for a few days so that they can harvest over you know a couple days time to get the number that they are looking for. Um, then they take these hermit crabs in a truck, um, cargo vehicles, sometimes in the hot sun, you know, in these bags without any kind of food or water and travel days sometimes to get to a holding facility or to you know a plane that you know will then ship them overseas or, or, or whatever and so um, once they get to these holding facilities um, they're oftentimes forced out of their natural shells either um, by humans pulling them out cracking their shells or by a drill press actually you know, putting the hermit, live hermit crab under the drill press and cracking them out of their natural shell, and then tossing these naked crabs into a bucket of painted shells and forcing them to choose one because a hermit crab will die without a shell. So at that point, um, toxic or not, you know, wet paint or not, a hermit crab's going to do its best to find a shell if it survives that whole process so far. Um, a lot of times those painted shells are still wet and they might even get painted into them and, and that'll be a death sentence as well. After you know being several days in these holding facilities, then um, they will package up some burlap sacks full of hermit crabs to be able to ship to beach shops, uh, souvenirs, um, you know, pet stores, mall kiosks, um, all these places that we've seen hermit crabs being sold. Again, they are without food, without water, and at this point, they're no longer in their natural environment, so they now um, are without the heat and the humidity that they also need to survive. So they are extremely dehydrated, they are um, starving, and a lot of them are injured. Um, so they make it to these stores to be sold and are kept in less than ideal conditions most of the time, um, where you know they are not given both types of water that they need, um, given you know pellet food to eat, which is toxic to them and harmful, um, usually not given the correct heat or humidity, that they need to actually breathe and so again they're sitting here in the stores waiting to be purchased in you know horrible conditions and slowly suffocating and slowly dying and so by the time they get to you at home um, a lot of damage has been done and a lot of times too much damage to overcome um, and millions millions of hermit crabs die at some point along this process um, before they ever get to you so Risky Pachanto lives in Indonesia and has actually visited one of these holding facilities and can recount like his 
personal feeling and what he saw um, at these compounds. The first thing that you noticed was the smell. Yeah, um, and it was even more pronounced that day because they just had a shipment came in. It was transported in in a not so ideal way. Yeah, uh, so the hermit crabs were exposed to uh, to the tropical heat, to the midday heat for God knows, you know. So I don't know. Uh, probably more than half of the hermit crabs uh, that came in the shipment were dead. And the first thing I, uh, I saw when I came into the gate was on my left, uh, there was a pile of, um, yeah, like the small rugosus and viola, and uh, it was dead, yeah, like just, just uh, they, they, it was, I think, uh, three feet high, the pile. Uh, I don't know how many, thousands um, uh, were there lying dead. As I go further in, I saw this uh, concrete vats and um, in the middle of the vat, they had this big bucket, you know, and uh, uh, in that big bucket, they just piled up all the dead ones, you know, um, again, three feet high. Yeah, oh, you know, it's all, they're all big, Hermit crabs just lying there dead, either um, they and they all were out of their shells. If it were dogs and cats that were dying that fast, if ever if people regularly had a dog or cat that died a month after it came home, imagine the outrage, you know. But because it's a little bitty crab that people think is insignificant, uh, it's okay. Uh, if we're going to take a wild animal from its perfect wild habitat and hold it captive in our home, it deserves the very best. To be treated like a toy or a plastic piece of nothing that can just be thrown away when you've lost interest in it is really disturbing to me. And conveying that message to children is equally disturbing to me. That this, because this life is so small, it doesn't matter. I'm not against people keeping them as pets, but so many of them die in the pet trade because the pet trade really is focused on economic gain and not education and proper animal hub husbandry or conservation of the wild population. So for me, it's about the hermit crabs not dying senselessly for no reason, just because we simply aren't telling them better. And information is free and knowledge is free. There's no reason for a pet store not to give you the information you need about your pet. What do they gain from not telling you the proper way to care for your animal? You know, it just, it doesn't make sense to me. The, the whole chain does not make any sense to me. As I became aware of the hermit crab industry, I mean, at the time, I didn't even know that all hermit crabs were wild caught. You know, I mean, that's really almost unheard of, you know, anymore most animals are captive bred. Uh, but once I learned of the industry, learned of the plight of the hermit crab, I mean, as a hobbyist, there was no way I could, you know, continue to support that type of industry. Every time, you know, I would go to a store and purchase a hermit crab, then that just gives the whole cycle the momentum they need to go out and harvest more and, and the whole thing. And, and so that more can be replaced in the store. So I'm not really rescuing any kind of hermit crab from a store. I'm perpetuating that horrible industry. And so, um, you know, I had to come to the decision that I would not support that and instead look at adopting. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. And, you know, Lycos has a great adoption program. Um, I've adopted hermit crabs through that program. Um, a lot of times you can get healthy crabs because people have been keeping them in great conditions and they just need to rehome them for whatever situation. Um, also, you can adopt from Facebook Market or Craigslist and that sort of thing. Again, these are crabs who are needing to be rehomed. And if we're not out there looking to get those crabs and bring them to our tanks, um, 
you know, they might just drop them in the backyard. I, I've heard horror stories about that. So put them in the trash, I don't know. But, you know, um, actively seeking out those types of crabs are also a really good idea. You're not supporting the trade in that way. I think somebody needs to, to continue to advocate so that we can really save hermit crabs lives. Save the wild crabs uh, from being completely wiped out, from being over harvested, simply out of our own ignorance. Over the past several years, many people have made attempts to captive breed in their homes. And there have been small successes over the years. And with each success, the next person to try builds on that a little bit more and builds on that a little bit more. One of the people in recent years who's been the most successful in captive breeding is Mary Akers. Mary Akers is currently the vice president of the Land Hermit Crab Owner Society, but she came into our Facebook group as any other member seeking help for her hermit crabs. I had no idea when Mary joined the group that she was gonna be as important as she is and that she was gonna be so important to me realizing my dream of seeing Lycos grow and make a change and that captive breeding was gonna be the step that we needed to, to really make a change in the pet industry. So she has built on the foundation of others to a point where we really feel like we can make captive breeding a successful venture and that we can someday change the pet trade. And I never would have expected somebody like Mary would come into my life, but I'm so glad she did. My name is Mary Akers. I am a hermit crab breeder, which I don't think too many people have said in the past. Um, my background is in, in science a little bit. Um, I co-founded a marine ecology school in Dominica. Uh, I worked for the School for Field Studies in the 90s, which is a study abroad marine program. So I've always been interested in the ocean and animals and um, yeah, what makes the world work, I guess. The breeding program is has has been evolving ever since I started. I first just wanted to see if I could do it. Um, I couldn't at first, and then I could, and then I succeeded really well. I guess a summary of the breeding process uh, would be: first, you hope that the crabs do their part. You spend a lot of time worrying and shining a light and checking for eggs and, and seeing if they're doing the right thing, being very in tune with their behavior. Uh, the females, in my experience, get very restless when they're looking to spawn. So you can kind of check behavior. When I can tell the females are at that stage, uh, I will put them in a bucket that's um, it's not clear, so they're so they're very, you know, they have one job. I have a rock they can climb out on, I have a really strong bubbler, and no other crabs around. They just have this quiet space to do their spawning safely. And then when they're done, I put them back in their tank and give them a nice treat to eat to uh, reward them. Um, so then you have the Zoe that have to be fed multiple times a day. They're, they go through five stages. Um, each stage is three to five, there's a three to five window between each stage, three days to five days. At roughly day 16, they um, start to make megalopa, which is when they have claws and all their legs and antenna and everything. They, that's that's a, the, the most difficult molt for them, the most dangerous one. A lot, a lot of their structures have to change. So day 16, I move them to a transition tank, which is just about three to four inches of water a bigger expanse of water in a bin with a lot of climb out areas for them and a lot of shells. Um, and that water has to be changed, but not as often, just portions of it. Um, and then they, then the rest is up to them. They, uh, that's the hardest part is waiting for them to, to be crabs, to, 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 find a shell and tuck their butt inside it and say, hmm, I think I'll walk on land now. Let's we'll see what's that like to breathe air. Um, and then they, you know, that, that miraculous journey of, of those, just those, I look at the ramp that I use, that's like a hundred miles for those little babies. And I'll see them come out and come out of the water and be like, whew, whew. 
you know, and, and they'll just sort of stop. And I usually take a toothpick and I dampen it and I pick up one blood worm and I just stick it right in front of them. And they're like, oh, okay. And they'll eat and eat and then they'll keep, keep trudging. I mean, it's just such a journey. It's such a, such a crazy journey, but it's usually about a month um, to get them to land. Um, so now, so, so the breeding program is not just about breeding. My crabs can breed all day long. Um, but then what happens with the babies, right? You, you get them, you put all that time in and all that effort in, and then you have these wonderful babies, hundreds of them perhaps. So I quickly realized that it wasn't just about breeding, it was about um, adopting them out, finding good homes for them. I, I'm really struggling with how to get them to homes because I don't want to lower their value it's really, it's really tough because I don't need $50 a crab for them. I love them enough. I would do it for free, but nobody's going to value them like exotic pets unless they pay exotic pet prices. There are snakes that sell for $20,000. There are spiders that sell for $500. A spider that might live seven years versus a hermit crab that lives 45 years. Why is his life valued? more than the hermit crab. Why is there more information available? People understand that that $500 spider needs something special. You better not kill it. But the $7 hermit crab, well, that was a trip to Starbucks. In order to actually make a difference, to be able to change the horrors of the hermit crab industry, we are gonna have to change the way people view hermit crabs. They you know, what animal should be labeled a souvenir? It's a living animal. So we have to change the way people view hermit crabs. They are not a throwaway pet. I think that um, we, the pet stores don't value them for what they are because they're wild caught and they, they treat them as a unlimited resource that they can just continue to go back and collect over and over again. They pay pennies for them. There's no value on their life. Uh, when meanwhile we're killing them at an alarming rate and wiping out those wild populations. So just getting the information out there about their care, just to get it somewhere near what the other exotic pets are, would be a big step forward to get them seen and respected for the valuable animal that they are, regardless of the price tag that a pet store puts on them. So in order to do that, you know, we have a great example in the exotic industry. We have snakes and tarantulas and lizards and turtles, um, and, and those have all been valued as exotic animals. And with that comes the price. Um, and it's up to us, this hobby, you know, hermit crab hobbyist, this community um, to support and be the leaders and be the example in changing that mindset. The thing that we need to do is just is i think just educating slowly educating um getting the word out uh but i think the most important thing to do is the the breeding however hard it is however time time consuming and um, money consuming it is it's it's possible and hopefully, slowly, we can give the crabs some breeding, breeding space, the, the wild crabs, yeah. And, and eventually, we get to the point, hopefully, where all the hermit crabs that are for sale are captive bred. Then none are being taken from the wild, and they've been ethically raised. You know, there's no puppy mills. It's not like they're going to go in the backyard and make a thousand babies. These babies have been lovingly raised from free swimming, almost microscopic uh, larvae. Um, they've been provided shells every step of their life to, to, to go up and size up in a shell. They have been loved. They have been cherished. They are not suffering and, and they would love to come to your house to live in your wonderful tanks with your good conditions and be a lifelong friend for you. Adopt babies. That's that's probably 
um, the, the, the most direct route to supporting the breeding program. It's this, it's this miraculous opportunity to see a creature from birth, know it's, it, the, you know, the, t the date that it was born and, um, and see it grow and, and, and have a relationship with it for its entire life. Um, it's visibility that we need. It is um, sharing the word <laughs> that we need um, and sharing what the babies mean to you if you have adopted. Um, you have a voice out there to help uh, uh, more crabs uh, simply by talking about how much you love your babies. <laughs> My name is Trisha. I'm Jackson. I'm Christine Altman. My name is Andrea Skinner. My name is Serena Huffman. And this is our adoption story. This, this is, is our adoption story. story. This is our adoption story. This is our adoption story. This is our adoption story. And this is our adoption story. I just want, wondered, is, has anything has anything happened? Are they breeding them in captivity yet? And I did a search and Mary Akers came up and I couldn't believe it. Then of course I came across baby hermit crabs and I remember being like, what? This, how? And because I thought you couldn't breed them and there's somebody who can. And so I followed her blog a little bit and I read what she was doing and it just, meant so much to me and I thought I really want to be part of that. I saw Mary with the babies. I was amazed. I was like, oh my goodness, somebody with them. And I was just like through the roof. And I didn't know who she was. And I contacted her saying, hey, if you ever want to get rid of some of them, keep me in mind. And so our wildest dreams and fantasies actually came true. And we didn't even think that was possible. And then when we got to New York and we met Mary, and I saw those babies, I just burst out bawling. I mean, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. The Mary started crying and it was so amazing and so beautiful. Um, it, it was overwhelming. There, there really are no words to explain when you know, without a doubt, you are looking at the miracle of life. Um, from the, the tiniest little creature, you know, and I thought I was prepared for how small they were. And it, it like I said, there, there's just no words. And then to be in this family of hermit crab enthusiasts, um, when they say you find your people, you, you really find your people. And we could all just be in awe of Mary and her amazing abilities. And she was, she was so calm about all of this, like, oh yes, here's all these little miracles and the rest of us are trying to pick our jaws up off the floor. So it was a once in a lifetime experience for sure. And we were sitting at the coffee table and I opened it up, the dog was really excited. He could tell something amazing was happening too. And they were all just so active. It wasn't anything like getting them from the pet store where they're just in their shell, terrified. They were all crawling around on the moss. They were so tiny, like smaller than a marble. And you can see this, that is so delicate and almost see-through and beautiful and curious. And we all had them, you know, we weren't sure, like, should we, should we hold them or not hold them? But I just couldn't resist. And so we had them crawling all over our, our hands and our arms and we were getting acquainted with them and looking at the beautiful shells that they were in. And opening up the package the first time and just seeing them and just like, holy cow, these things have never had another home outside of the one in Mary's. And just being like, they're in my house and they're gonna be mine forever. And like 40 years, you know, if I hopefully live that long, that was, it was just really amazing. Just holding them and just going, these are mine and they were Mary's and there's only ever been two owners and they weren't like stolen off some beach somewhere and they don't know anything other than what Mary showed them and then what I'm going to show them. Cool to just see the random things like, wow, that's the first time this baby ever did that because you know the whole history of the baby from 
when it was being spawned to taking its shells to coming out, which if you buy a store-bought crab, you have no idea of its history or where it came from. I just, I like seeing them grow. I like seeing them grow from like such a small size and watching how their color is developing and, you know, when they come up, what, what kind of shells that they're choosing. It's just fun watching them discover new things. But one thing that I think is fascinating is they're all born at the same time, all raised the same way, but we have some that are big and some that are still really small. So they're all unique, they're all different, they all have different personalities. One of my babies is super active and he's out a lot and I see him a lot. Strangely enough, the one I named Bashful is always missing. <laughs> the babies, they, they'll they like see them like stumbling everywhere and they'll be in weird spots and doing weird things. These most adorable things, like when you just see how little they are and they're crawling all over everything and I go down every night around dusk and look in the tank and play I Spy, see how many babies I can find. And I get endless enjoyment out of it. They're just so much fun. So it's definitely different owning the baby, the babies than, than the adult ones. You know, you can, they can get to know that it's, oh my goodness, this big giant hand coming in here isn't gonna hurt me. It's not gonna remove me from my environment. It's, it's going to keep me safe and that's, to me, that's exponentially different than, uh, there's a big giant hand, I'm gonna run over here. A really interesting thing that I uh, noticed about my captive red babies is that they do absolutely adore uh, my larger crabs. And I thought it was really interesting, the relationship that they had right away with the, with the larger crabs. They each kind of adopted a buddy like one of the old timers is a buddy. And I would see the same like two or three crabs around the big fella all the time. Like uh, it was like, he, it was like the big crab was a planet and they were the, the moons, you know? And they were just always kind of in a close proximity. And that happened for the first like month and a half. And then they, and then they kind of, but it was, it was like, it was like, um, you know, each, each one had a, had a mentor in the tank and I just thought that that was such a so darn cute it was so adorable they're so cute and then just knowing where they came from and how you know how they were raised how they were brought into life I mean it's it's like really I don't know it's just it's really sweet it's really tender it's really awesome to be in part of something that's that big you know and I mean they're they're so cute they're so adorable they're just I mean they're tiny and you know everybody loves babies right and so and then i mean just seeing how much mary had worked how hard she worked on raising them i was really moved by mary's story and i i i wasn't sure that i wanted more crabs at that at that time but i felt it was really really important to be a part of it and i just i felt compelled to be a part of it i really wanted to get in on this historical thing that had happened. And, you know, I, I have other exotics. And when I was a kid, I had like a, a, you know, the chameleons and they were all, they were all wild caught at that time. And they all came in with parasites and they were sick and they didn't live long and they were very stressed. And it was just, it was horrendous. And then somebody figures out how to breed them and everything is just elevated. Once they're being bred in captivity, then the whole industry is being elevated. You have healthy animals that were cared for, that have, you know, aren't stressed. They didn't get ripped from their wild habitat. They've known nothing but these crazy apes who want to take care of them. And, um, and it just is a, so much more enjoyable. We wanted to adopt captive bred babies to help change the industry and to help contribute, do our part as far as raising awareness of how crabs are captured out in the wild and how we are successfully able to breed in captivity now and what a difference that would make to, to the industry and to these crabs that are, you know, captured in the wild in such horrific conditions. It's surreal. I mean, bringing any life into this world is pretty 
crazy, <laughs> pretty amazing. Um, and just knowing that it was considered impossible and now there are hundreds of babies still waiting for homes is pretty great. It, babies that didn't have to be ripped from their home or depleting um, natural resources of shells and just to import them. It's, it means a lot more than just having a crafted red baby to own and to show people. I, I think it means a lot in regards to the crabs who are wild caught every day. They were part of owning these babies is just being part of the history of it. Because we are breaking new ground and trying to like, for lack of a better word, mass produce these babies so that the ones in the wild can just be left alone and live free the way they're supposed to. I mean, we captive breed a lot of other animals and so why not hermit crabs? I think that like with what Mary is doing, she can't do it by herself. And even though like I only adopted four babies, that's still four babies that, you know, went into a home and she can't do it by herself. She can't place all the babies just by us adopting from the groups. Like it, it has to go bigger than that. So I do like, and it has to start somewhere and it starts with us. I feel like I'm part of something so much bigger than myself and that I can, with just this simple little thing, which is committing to, you know, adoption, and I can be part of changing the, the way that these crabs are treated in the wild. This tiny little part that I have, if we all get together and do it, then we've transformed the industry for these creatures and made it, I, I really want the pet industry to know how valuable these guys are. And it makes me so angry that they're a throwaway pet. That they're, for, they're like the hardest pet I own, really. They're the one that takes the most commitment. It breaks my heart, like, to think about that many crabs getting taken off of the beach and shoved into bags and who knows how many weeks they're without food and water. And I think that if we can get the world to see exactly what this process entails, what these little critters go through, they'll be able to hold more value in them and see them as the exotic pet that they are. Every little thing counts, you know? So definitely I, I would try to educate because I was that classic hermit crab owner that had no idea. I did not know <laughs> what I was getting into. So I feeling that I was a good bit of hermit crabs and they are like, what? Yeah. And they're like, I'm dying two weeks. And I was like, well, I'm not going to take it now. I just take care of them. They have kids involved in it because like you say, he'll, he talks to his friends and that's where it starts. You know, not many adults go, I want a hermit crab and, you know, go find them. It's usually, you know, kids are involved and want them. So, you know, if you can start at the root with the kids and, and them hearing from other kids how to take care of them properly, no, you can have them as pets for years and you just have to take care of them. They're not a throwaway pet, they're a commitment. And if we all get together, those of us who love these guys and see their value, if we all get together, we can, we can show what they're worth. I really see the captive bred baby industry like really taking off, but it's going to take a while to get to that point because we have to educate enough of the other people that are out there. Um, it helps that we do have these Facebook hermit crab groups. There's the um, Instagram, Reddit, Tumblr to put out the information and of course YouTube to put out the information and hopefully that can reach as many people as possible. and more people will realize it's not such an impossible task to breed these anymore. It's still very difficult, but it's not impossible. I think that um, each person who adopts, it might not seem like a big change 
write off, but the more people we can encourage to adopt, for sure, it's gonna it's gonna change. Especially with the captive breads coming into boot, like people can stop getting them from pet stores. Pet stores will just have to either start getting them from our captive bred breeder, and hopefully just end having to take them from the wild and just let those hermit crabs thrive in their environment. I, I feel very honored to have some of the babies. I got some of the initial batches, you know. Um, I don't know. Like I said, I'm supporting further breeding projects by getting them, so. It's an exciting change. It's, it's exciting and it's hopeful and to be able to be a part of this whole process is just mind blowing to me. I'm excited about it. I feel very privileged and honored to play a part in, you know, the future of these babies. It's, I love every aspect of it. Captive breeding is not something really necessarily new. It's not a new idea per se. It's something that has um, been going on for years actually. People in the hermit crab community have been working hard at captive breeding. However, it's just recently um, really taken off because, you know, mother of all crabs, Mary Akers, has had such success um, recently at being able to bring enough hermit crabs to land that they can then be adopted out um, in a sustainable way. And she's also made um, her whole process of breeding um, accessible to other at-home breeders and is just like so caring and loving and um, knowledgeable and willing to share that knowledge um, so that we can actually have captive breeding um, make a difference in the hermit crab industry. Uh, being, being able to captive breed hermit crab um, means that it's possible uh, to for us to do differently and not, and not just stick to the old method. I just feel like there's so much room for growth and there's so much need um, that, you know, I, I just can't sit back and not do my part, I feel like. Um, I've learned a lot about them. I've learned to appreciate them as an animal and I want to share that with other people. I think um, they will definitely, I feel like, gain value as an exotic animal uh, when people actually learn everything that they do and how amazing that, that they are. And spread the word. We need people to understand the complexity, the uniqueness, um, the incredible role that these animals play in the wild. Whether you're a hermit crab owner or not, there is something you can do. Even if it's just sharing what you learned on social media and spread the education. You know, we spread silly videos about, you know, nonsense all the time. Share some education. You never know who's watching your feed. You never know who's gonna see it. If you have hermit crabs, do the same thing, but post pictures of your crabs. On, don't just hide your crabs away in the Facebook group. Post them on your own timeline. You have no idea who else out there on your social media account might be considering hermit crabs, might have hermit crabs, and they may wanna ask questions. It'll open you up to, to asking questions. You can share what you know. Um, you can support Mary's breeding program and talk to people about how important captive breeding is. Uh, there's a couple of ways that people can support the breeding program. They can um, adopt babies. That's that's probably um, the, the, the most direct route to supporting the breeding program. And that's not just because you are taking the babies off of my hands, which is helpful because I have a lot, but um, I don't know anyone who's adopted their babies and hasn't photobombed the internet with pictures, um, shared it on their Facebook, shared it on their Instagram, um, and that spreads the word. So, so it's, it's adopting, 
If you can't adopt, you can still share other people's photos of, of these tiny, miraculous little creatures. So adopt, don't shop. That's our message. Um, you can adopt a captive bred baby. You can adopt an, uh, an unwanted crab that can't go back into the wild because he's been ca in captivity. There are no words to prepare you for what you're about to experience and how amazing these little guys are. We're all sort of learning together what they need, how best for them to, to survive and thrive. We're learning as we go. We're running to keep from falling. Um, we're trying to figure it out. And, and I think we're doing a great job, really. I mean, all things considered, uh, you know, a few people alone in their houses with their crabs uh, working to change the industry. Um, doesn't get more grassroots than that. I love to try and put things into words, and I'm not even sure I know how to put that this obsession into words. They're just base, base. Their whole essence speaks to me at a very deep level.